Many believe that binaural recordings cannot be enjoyed through loudspeakers and that they can only be enjoyed through headphones. But is that a misconception? This is a myth. It, is, it was right with the first generation, with the KUAT. This, its signals were not compatible with loudspeaker because of the loss of high frequencies. It was very, very muddy. The sound don't um, sounds very, very good. And then we found out that we don't have to look for a flat frequency response in the anarchic chamber for the signals in front of the head, but we have to consider that the dummy head is not close to the microphones or to the orchestra or to the singer, but more far away in the room. So you need not to have the free sound field record um, frequency response, but the diffuse field frequency response is with a high quality stereophonic microphone by Neumann or from other companies which are flat for more far away. Yeah, we were so familiar with the free sound field uh, frequency response with developing standard microphones that we didn't think about what should be different by having the um, dummy head. And the dummy head is not used in within the close range to mic to to the singers or, or instruments or artists, but more far away in the room, as the audience is sitting in the room, not at the orchestra, but more far away. And this is the um, critical distance. The critical distance. Not the, yeah, it's outside the critical distance. Inside the so-called critical distance, there's a difference by turning the microphone, for example, because of the polar pattern or to the behavior of the microphones. Outside the critical distance, it is more or less the same. So if you change the angle of the microphone relative to the uh, stage, it makes not so much difference instead of close to the instruments. That makes sense. For anyone unfamiliar with this term, critical distance, that's basically the point in a space where the direct sound is of equal level to the indirect sound. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. and so you realize that with normal microphones, the free field acoustic or um, anechoic chamber measurements mm -hmm. were most important. But with a microphone like this, the intention is to place it much further back, like a listener would be. No one's on stage with their ear exactly. right next to a violin. <laughs> yeah. um, they're back uh, in the center of the yeah. room. Yeah. And since we realized this in the artificial head, it was automatically compatible to loudspeaker reproduction. And how did you adjust the design to account for that? Especially electronically and acoustically inside, because there is some room between the outer ear and the beginning of the microphone. And this room or this area we can use to have acoustic means to adjust the frequency and polar pattern a little bit. And you'd also mentioned that at first we assumed that to get the most realistic sound, we needed to most realistically emulate the outer ear and middle ear and inner ear. But then we realized that actually only a very shallow um, bit of that middle and inner ear is required. Yeah. I'm probably yeah. butchering that explanation. Could you explain that? When you take a very small microphone, putting into the ear canal, you can check point millimeter by millimeter or half millimeters by half millimeters the influence of the outer ear into the ear canal. And after four millimeters roundabout, you don't will find any difference by variation of the outer ear by means of the ear canal. But the 
complete different problem is that by coupling the ear canal to any microphone, it is like a wall. The sound is coming to a wall, which is the membrane of the microphone or the microphone capsule at all. And this makes reflections and damages of the frequency response. So you have to build in specific means to control this or to avoid these things. Yeah. Because in our own ears, we don't have a gigantic microphone <laughs> diaphragm. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. We need to adjust accordingly. Yeah.